Peace, everybody. This is your brother, Mark Lamont Hill. You're listening to the Classroom and the Cell podcast. And joining me is... Mumia Abu Jamal. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that one sounded a little light, man. And <laughs> <laughs> switch it up, right? Yeah, I like that. I like that, man. You, you, you still got the R&B DJ uh, voice in your background, too, in, 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 your, in your voice, too. I like it, man. I like it. One day when you come home, man, we're gonna have you, you're going to be doing a quiet storm again. There you go. I'm going right there. You hear me? Yeah, that's that's, that's what I'm talking about, man. That's what I'm talking about. Um, so so yesterday, uh, we were talking about Palestine, and of course we got cut a little short. Um, but we were starting to really get to it. You know, one of the things we were talking about was how Palestine was beginning to kind of emerge on our radar. Um, another thing that you know in the '60s and '70s, and another thing that we you know was talking about was the kind of relationship between the PLO and some of the black radical organizations. And then you were also just breaking down, you know, how the world is watching this thing and how, you know, it's impossible to see this thing and not, and not call it what it is. Yeah. Well, you know, when the median changes, uh, consciousness changes. And, you know, we had, uh, back in the day, you know, if you tell a young person that's 20 or even 30, that they used to be like three, TV channels <laughs> that were working. And, uh, it's impossible. <laughs> yeah, they can't even, their minds can't even, you know, this is free cable. I'm, you know, you saw the world through ABC, NBC, and CBS, essentially. And uh, the big papers and a few local regional papers. And, and so you saw the world through a pinhole, essentially. This is not that world anymore. And... Uh, while I don't consider social media truly social media, I consider it anti-social media. What it has done is enlarged that uh, little pinhole into kind of a universe of different ways of looking at the world and from different perspectives. And we're seeing war in a way that we never saw it before. You know, in many ways, I, that, that's that's real, man. You know, I, I think about that with regard to Vietnam. I mean, obviously, Vietnam was nothing like this in terms of our media access, but but in terms of you know people actually knowing that there were dead bodies and seeing the bodies and seeing people coming back home, it shaped consciousness about the war. You know, I think about Rodney King getting beaten in L.A. and people said, "Oh, wait a minute, this thing is real." This is a and, call from Pennsylvania State Correctional Institution, Mahanoy. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. And to do a little pre-Rodney King, I mean, the beating of Delbert Africa on August 8, 1978, that was live and on video, you know. And, sure. And to see that is to see the world as it is and not how we were taught it was or we were told it was. This is the same in, in many respects, and it's eye-opening, and it's it's uh, alarming, it's frightening, it's horrifying, it's amazing, and uh, it's everything but beautiful, you know. Everything but beautiful is the right way to put it, man. I mean, I'm I'm watching people who were previously silent on this issue, either because they were afraid or because they didn't see the connection or because they didn't have the motivation, um, now suddenly standing up and speaking out, and a lot of it has to do with the outrage of seeing tens of thousands of people killed and hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people, excuse me, displaced. I mean, when you when you and not to mention the thousands who are injured, and it's it's really changing it's really changing the game. But what do you say to people who say, "Look, I'm a Negro in America. I got enough to worry about. I'm a white worker in America. I got enough to worry about with you know labor and you know ex- outsourcing the jobs and exploitation, etc. I can't worry about elsewhere until I take care of home first. What do you say to those people? Well, here's the problem with that analysis. You never really take care of home. And people talk about taking care of home. But when you look at something like that and you cannot, it's like a car accident, you cannot turn away, then what happens in Palestine, right, what happens in Gaza, what happens in the West Bank, what happens in the Sudan, what happens abroad enters. This is a call from Pennsylvania State Correctional Institution, Mahanoy. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. There are no borders in consciousness. So, you know, 
when we talk about home, what we're really trying to do is deflect from the pain and the shock that we see because, you know, it terrifies us, right? It Absolutely. Us, discomforts us. But uh, Alexis de Tocqueville said, of all things, Americans love their comfort. Well, this is uncomfortable, and it's meant to be. Because, you know, war is uh, uncomfortable, you know. That's right. That's right. I mean, I think it's also important to think about not just the the lack of borders or the consciousness, which is absolutely right. That speaks to our moral imperatives, our philosophical, you know, kind of um, worldviews and such. Um, But also our analysis and the forces of power don't stop at the border either. So, you know, you can talk about dismantling white supremacy. You could talk about dismantling capitalism. You could talk about ending imperialism. But I just I don't see any way to do that without talking about Sudan, without talking about, uh, you, you, you know, uh, Haiti. And certainly to talk about Palestine as well. That's exactly right. And, you know, like, I think because I've been swimming in the river of Fanon, uh, oh, yeah. you can't look at the world without his analysis. And, you know, I look at this and I say, these people are truly the wretched of the earth. Mm. And, uh, you know, there's very few communities that can uh, withstand what they have withstood or sh- or should have to withstand, you know. And, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a portent of things to come. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, th- I think so. D- does does it change your calculus about uh, here domestically uh, elections and such? You know, Joe Biden's failure to call for a ceasefire, for example, has a lot of young people. For example, I have a college age daughter who called me and said, "I don't think I can vote for Joe Biden, knowing that he is enabling both through not calling for a ceasefire, but also you know with weapons and money." This genocide in Gaza, you know, and I tried to get her to think about it in a more nuanced and complicated way, but in a very fundamental and basic way, she's like, how can I support someone who's doing something this immoral? You know, her decision aside, whether she's right or wrong to me is less the point and more the question of, are there going to be a million young people, 5 million young people, 20 million young people, or or 10 million leftists or or, or, or 500,000 Arabs or whoever who are thinking the same way who push Trump into office, ironically, um, maybe the the greatest fascist we've ever seen in the White House, in recent White House years, right? Pushing him into the White House precisely because of the Biden administration's failure to stand up to fascism and to imperialism and to these other forces. Well, not just to stand up to it, to, to be like uh, a great right. enabler. Allies, yeah, yeah. And one of the biggest arms uh, dealers on the planet. I mean, we got to, you know, call a state a state. You know, Israel in the Middle East is a regional hegemon. They are power in that area, and everybody knows it. No one speaks about it. And they are actually, let's come on, let's go there. They're a nuclear power. Come on now. Yes, they are. And, and they yeah. want you to know that. You know, they'll never admit, they'll, they don't deny it, but they never admit it. But I can tell you, somebody who's been in Jamona, driven past the nuclear you know you near a nuclear site when you go down they got the nuclear weapons ain't no ain't no jokes about ain't no lie about that so you know so you know they they run that area you know as a kind of proxy for u.s power and uh i love it when they talk about the hoodies and these other rebels and uh the, the cats in lebanon as proxies for iran well who's the proxies for america Oh, well, you know, that's different. <laughs> that's different. Oh, okay. all right. All right. <laughs> that's Shoot different, Mo. You know, the the Houthis in Yemen and the and Hezbollah and Iran, all that stuff, that's different. When you talk about uh, the U.S., they're, they, they're forces for good. They're freedom fighters. Yeah. <laughs> hey. All right. That's how we're going to play this. <laughs> that's what they, that's, look, they be spinning it. I don't know if we're going we gonna to wear it, but that's how they spinning that silk, man. They're going to spin it, bro. It's been a, but, uh, you know, it, it, these are times that try men's souls, and these are the kinds of uh, events that awaken people. You know, we were talking about the Vietnam War. 
And yeah, I remember that era vividly as a student and a young man, teenager, to be honest. And um, that was the number one thought on the young people in America. That's one of the things that drove uh, the anti-war movement, right, and the student movement of the 1960s and the 1970s. Mm. If you were a male of a certain age, you could have been drafted. So right. everybody had a, you know, had a shoe in, in, in the boot, so to speak. And right. it, it drove movements and it transformed American society culturally, but also politically in many ways. And, you know, we shouldn't be surprised that this does the same thing, depending on how long it goes and how deep it goes and how horrible it goes. The, the, no one, you know, go ahead. You know, no, no, war is the go ahead. All, war is the mother of all things. But we don't know what's going to be given birth here. I'm wondering if, you know, and I don't want to re- reduce everything to electoral politics because there's so much more at stake here, but I, I do wonder you know, whether the Biden administration m- misplayed um, their hand here. You know, there's a way that if you're a white man running for president up into 2008, you could say, you know what, white men are undefeated, right? I'm going to just take my chances with the white man card. I should be able to beat this black guy, right? But then something something changed, you know? Yeah. I'm siding with Israel unequivocally since at least the 70s, right? Since at least 73 has been the move, and it hasn't uh, reaped any negative outcomes for U.S. presidents. Like, no one loses an election for standing with Israel. You know, Jimmy Carter's lost, you know, power for standing not next to the PLO, but just being somewhat reasonable. You know, even Jesse Jackson in 84 and 88 took some some hits for talking about a, t- a two-state solution. You remember. And, 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 and again, having some critique, right, and being willing to meet with Arafat, right? So, but but in general, you win if you side with Israel, but it seems like now... Have we gained enough consciousness in this country? Have we gained enough dissent and outrage at what's happening that maybe the political calculus changes? Well, it's entirely possible because, you know, uh, this is a transformative moment, and we don't know where it's going to come out, but we know that we can't look at things the way we did before. It just doesn't work. That's a, that, is a, that is a fact. Now, I love you too, man. Man, I'm... Always a pleasure, man. I, t- I, I took your advice on uh, on on some of that that honey and the garlic, and I'm already feeling better, man. You're gonna be in addition to a radio DJ. We're gonna make you a doctor too when you come home. That's what I'm talking about. Love you. That's, love you too, man. On the move. Everybody, the caller has hung up. Everybody, you've been listening to the classroom and the cell. The podcast with Mumia Abu Jamal and myself, Mark Lamont Hill. For more content like this, please go to the Mark Lamont Hill official YouTube channel where you can find the entire Classroom in the Cell podcast series. You can listen to old episodes. You can also hit the bell so you can get alerts for new episodes. Also, check out the entire page where we have information across the board for anybody interested in radical thought, political education, and critical education. All right, y'all. I love y'all. See y'all soon. Peace.